everybody and uh, welcome to the Morris Federation series of uh, talks and workshops during lockdown. And um, today we have a joint presentation. Um, so this is partly, um, I'm Pauline Wazlawson, President of the Morris Federation, and this is a joint presentation with the Taborah Society or the Taborah Society, depending on how historically accurate you want to be and whether you want to be in with Andy Richards or Stephen Rowley, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I will now hand straight over to Stephen. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, actually, it depends whether you want to be in with Stephen Rowley or Stephen Rowley. <laughs> right. Uh, anyway, no problem. Right. Um, so I am uh, just going to uh, introduce myself, um, Steve Rowley, and um, I'm going to share screen. Yeah, I'm Steve Rowley. Some of you may know me. I recognise lots of people uh, in the audience there, so uh, uh, amongst a lot of friends. And um, some of you may know me as a hobby horse maker. And, um, oops, uh, where we go here. Um, there I am um, making hobby horses at Sidmouth and the ringmaster of the Sidmouth Horse Trials. Uh, some may know me as the founder of the International Mummers Festival. I'm in there somewhere. Um, and uh, there's, or I can see at least one former president of the Morris Fed there as well. And um, I've done, been working in photo education over the last 25 years. And uh, with Andy, uh, it's actually how I really got to know Andy, we formed a thing called Rose Moresque, which um, I really wanted to, after reading uh, John Forrest's book, I really wanted to try and work out what did Morris look like right at the beginning of his book. Uh, so that was that project. Um, but if you dig down deep enough right into my core, you'll find that I am a tabberer, a player of the pipe and tabber. Note, I say tabber. Um, this is based on historical information. Um, uh, others do say tabber. And um, I learned to play in the 1970s <clears throat> and I was inspired by and encouraged by some legends of the instrument. I lived near St Albans. I had many role models and teachers, in particular people like uh, Mike Chandler and uh, Graham Lyndon Jones, Tony Barrett, people like that, and not far away, Burke Cleaver. So I was amongst uh, uh, tabbering royalty there. Gradually through the 1980s and 90s, I saw the instrument decline in numbers and popularity to the extent that by the end of the 90s, I realized we were in danger of losing not just the pipe and tabber, but something vital to Morris dance and our understanding of it. And um, there was at that time, no real focal point for the instrument. A dwindling number of Morris players that seemed to be getting a lot older, including myself and a few early music players. And it was difficult to source instruments. In 1999, I had the opportunity to um, do something about it. And uh, I set up the international uh, Pipe and Tabber Festival in Gloucester. And uh, my aim really was to use that as a focal point to gather Tabras together, provide a support network and to raise the profile uh, and hopefully um, maintain some standards because there was some, uh, some pretty poor playing going on around. Um, so um, there I know, I, there are people I know here at, at the talk uh, this evening that were very much part of those early festivals and helping to make them happen. Six years later, in 2005, we had enough regular uh, members or uh, attendees of the festival to form a society which now has over 250 members, the Tabras Society. Um, so that's quite a lot of effort to ensure the survival of an unfashionable and many would say archaic instrument. But for me, it was only partly about the instrument much more about the Morris tabbering tradition and what the Pipe and Tabber tells us about playing for Morris. So this is a talk um, about the history of Morris music, mainly concerned with Cotswold Morris. I'm gonna start looking at the early years and what we know about the music during the genesis of Morris. We'll look briefly at the heyday of Cotswold Morris and the musicians of the 19th century um, and how much music has changed that period. And then the main meat of the talk will be about the 20th century and in particular two musicians who played a key role in the revival. And we'll um, hopefully in the discussion go on to look at the 21st century and uh, where that leaves us today. So I hope we'll have plenty of time for discussion. So uh, let's go back to time immoral 
and uh, uh, we find Moresque across uh, much of Europe and in uh, Germany, Austria. This image is by Ian Israel van Meckenham, and uh, you can see the Moresque dancers here with their bell. Well, actually, there's not much in the way of bells on this one. There is on the next one, um, but with gestures. There's a fool over here. There's a lady with a a, a symbolic gift to give one of the dancers and a tabra on the right. And here's a more elaborate version uh, by the same uh, designer. And uh, uh, um, yeah, quite interesting. It's quite difficult to see that one, but the tabra is down the bottom here and the ladies in the middle and the fool is down here as well. Uh, <clears throat> when we come to England in the early 16th century, this is the carving from um, uh, Lancaster and you can see here a lady with a ladle you're the ladle you're the ladle that I love uh, there's the tabra and here are the four dancers from the school of Morecambe and Wise bring me sunshine and uh, the fool on the end and uh, most are familiar with the um, Betley window which is now in the V&A and we can see the tabra here and uh, there's uh, the lady in this case is Maid Marion down here holding a rose. And uh, there is a fool up here. Now, there is an interesting thing that the Van Meckenham, perhaps I can go back, and the, uh, these two images and the uh, Lancaster and Betley images, um, all from you know, within 50 years of each other, are all are very much linked um, because Van Beckenham produced a design book um, which included these images of uh, tab uh, um, Moresque dancers, uh, which was clearly copied or informed the designs of the later ones. However, this next uh, image is from uh, Abington, Abington Manor, Northampton, possibly around 1510, 1515. And it's got much of the same features, the dancers um, with their bells, the extreme gestures, leaping over the sword backwards, the tabara, the lady with the rose and the jester with his ladle, you're the ladle, um, all performing there. Wonderful, wonderful carving. Um, so uh, right the way through um, from the earliest times when we find Morris and Moresque, we find uh, a tabara playing for it. Here's Thomas Sly. Um, in 1599, playing for Will Kemp on his Nine Days Wonder to Norwich. And um, at this time, Pipe and Tabber features up, uh, features in popular culture. Uh, Thomas Wilkes has a, a wonderful uh, poem, Strike Up Tabber and Pipers of Fava. <laughs> um, Thou shalt be well paid for their labour. I mean to sell my shoe and dance around the maypole and, uh, and so on. Lusty Dick Hopkin lay with the napkin, the stitching Cosby butter Dodkin, the Morris were half undone. And uh, I like the lines at the end, strike up Tabber and Piper of Fava, thou shalt be well paid by their labour. And uh, we find uh, from then on, Tabbers featuring in courtly and then household accounts, specifically being paid for playing, either for dance or for Morris, but often being paid separately. Um, uh, the next image people will know from, um, uh, it's the Fitzwilliam Museum, isn't it? Uh, and on the Thames at Kingston, I've gone into the detail here with the, um, with the, the dancers. There's a jester off to the side here, uh, a lady there and the tabra playing uh, here. And, and it's not till we get to the 1770s that we get our first actual Morris music artifact, which is the Chipping Camden Pipe, um, known Providence as the first uh, as uh, as the first tabor pipe collected in England with a proven connection to Morris dance, played for the dancers in Chipping Camden. It's an interesting pipe. <clears throat> you can see that it's got three finger holes here, and then it's got three more which are plugged up, and. Uh, Examination of the pipe shows that it was a three hole pipe originally converted to a six hole whistle, then converted back to a three hole table pipe and um, uh, actually and one of the one of the plugs has come out of the front here and there's a hole on the back. 
Um, a number of good Morris tunes come from that period and uh, uh, the evidence from the names of the Morris tunes indicates that there was a huge growth in Morris dance from that period. Um, Cotswold Morris as an identity comes real in the late 18th century and enters its heyday in the beginning of the 19th century. Keith Chandler in his Ribbons, Bells and Squeaking Fiddles has done an excellent job of tracking down and recording the presence of Morris dancers and their musicians across the South Midlands. And also I, I want to mention here Gwilym Davis and Paul Burgess in their work on the Morris uh, musicians of the region. However, <clears throat> Musicians were in short supply and many musicians would play for several teams. In fact, it was um, definitely a source of income. Uh, Chandler describes in a talk, which I don't think is published yet, about the Daw family of Finstock. Uh, they were dancers and musicians performing for both Finstock and the neighbouring Leafield, or Field Town as it's known. He describes how one Whitson the most important day in the Morris calendar, the family fielded musicians for both teams, Finstock and Leafield. At lunchtime, the two sides happened to fetch up at the same halfway house on the border between the parishes. Each side was to defend, determined to defend what they felt was their God-given right to cash money at this lucrative venue. A fight ensued, at the end of which there was but only six dancers left standing. So they combined forces and continued as one side for the cash they would earn that day was too important for them to miss out. However, for the musicians, it was worth their while to go on the tour for the day. They were paid a fixed sum, no matter how poor their pickings were. Um, if we go back in time to 1733, there's a newspaper report about a tabra called Thomas Hill of Hempstead. Um, when two of his children were seriously injured in a domestic fire, and, uh, and this was on Whitsuntide. And in the report, the report reads, one of which, this is the children, is since dead, the other lies dangerously ill. It is observable that the affectionate father, who was the tabara, was then attending a company of Morris dancers with his tabber and pipe. And when the news of the melancholy accident was brought to him, he refused to return home, saying he would not miss his Whitsuntide. Um, in the 1850s, Stephen Dorr of Finstock would charge seven shillings for a day, accompanying the Morrisman. In 1880s, Charles Benfield of Bledington would take home ten shillings from the collection box before the rest was shared out amongst the dancers. Um, it wasn't just about the money, though. John, James Simpson of Sherborne, known as Jim the Laddie, was a tabara, and in 1856 he went with the team to play at Barton on the Water on the Monday, and then Stowe Club, where he stayed until Tuesday. On his way home, he called in at the New Inn and joined in with a party, at which he drank so much he was removed to an apartment. At nine the next morning, he was found in an uneasy state, and medical assistance was sent for. But before the doctor arrived, he ceased to breathe with a pipe and tabber in his hand. However, by the late 1800s, perhaps not unsurprisingly, the pipe and tabber was gradually disappearing. Prior to um, 1840, Cotswold music was almost entirely whittle and dub, as it was known, or pipe and tabber. There was a rare reference to a bagpipe, which could be the pipe, <laughs> and flute and drum, which all may be confusions about the term pipe and tabba. But, oops, there we go. Um, oh, well, here's an example from the Library of Congress of a typical pipe and tabba, this one from 1806, the small narrow tabba um, and the uh, short pipe. That one uh, bound up probably because it's got cracks in the wood. Um, so why was the, the uh, pipe and tabba disappearing? Firstly, there was a lack of tabras. Sides are recorded as um, having not been able to find a tabra and some sides disappeared because they could not find a tabra. There was a lack of instruments. Um, uh, finding an instrument like a, a tabble pipe was a specialist thing. There weren't many makers. Uh, they were on occasion passed on from musician to musician, 
but many were lost when the tabra died. The instrument was not easy to un obtain otherwise, unlike an instrument like the fiddle, for which there were many makers and importers, and they were used in other genres of music. There was also a lack of teachers. Um, there was an increasing number of people who could teach an instrument like the fiddle, but you could only really learn pipe and tabba from another tabara. There was also a perception that it was difficult to play. Jinky Wells at Bampton, the fiddler, said it was wonderful what they produced from a three-hold instrument, and Sam Bennett at Ilmington marvelled, the mystery is how did they play all the old tunes on a pipe with one hole under for the thumb and two holes above for the fingers, and a little finger, and all played with the left hand, which also had a tabba hanging from the thumb. The right hand used the tabba stick. Um, but it wasn't because the dancers didn't want the pipe and tabba or the audience. In 1914, Jinky Wells said, they used to play much slower on the whistle and dub, but it was beautiful. You could grasp every moment. And later he opined, the style of dancing was much the best and it's a pity the old much loved whittle and dub couldn't be brought back and it's wonderful players for with it, without the slightest knowledge of much education or musical talent, the easy but graceful step to time as a marvel and some rare good players. Mary Neal observed that the oldest dancers today never tired of lamenting that the pipe and tabba to which they danced in their youth had gone out of fashion. In 1858, an eyewitness at Bampton, one Whit Mundy, declared that the dances were very credibly performed, but we cannot approve of the substitution of a squeaking fiddle for the appropriate, in our mind, orthodox tabber and pipe. And a couple of years later, they lamented further at Bampton, still obstinately persist in employing a squeaking fiddle instead of the more leg legitimate pipe and tabber notwithstanding what has been said respecting it and what considerably marred the effect as a, as a whole. Technically though, it seems unlikely to the uninitiated that a three hole instrument would have a range of more than four notes. A good pipe with a good player could easily trill out an octave and a half, which encompasses nearly all of the Cotswold Morris repertoire. And with the right combination, a two octaves can be achieved. The secret to this high range is down to the narrow cylindrical bore and overblowing the pipe to get harmonics in the same manner that one can overblow a valveless uh, natural trumpet. The apparent complexity of playing the tabble pipe is much simplified because it is a diatonic instrument uh, like the melodeon or the Anglo concertina. The notes you want are there and easy to play and there's none of the other notes to get in the way. <laughs> Meanwhile, the right hand ostensibly has the simplest of tasks, namely to beat a drum. When you compare that dexterity to that which is required to play a chromatic accordion or a finger-picked guitar, the tabra's right hand has a much easier job. The melody was high and could be heard above the hubbub of the crowd. It served to phrase the dance and prodding the memory for which figure or chorus move was next. However, the right hand element of the combination was that the, was the part that delivered what the dancer required, the ability to tell him when to hit the ground and land, the essential communication tool through the set. Joseph Stafford of Headington commented on how the drum kept pretty well in with the steps. And Keith Chandler in his book, um, Squeaking Ribbons, Bells and Squeaking Fiddles, um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, interprets uh, this as uh, the, the rhythm, uh, that the, it plays, ex the striking of the tabba plays exactly with the footfalls of the steps, but not the hop. So giving a distinctive strike, 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 strike. This concurs exactly with tabbering practice across Europe, playing the footfalls. The pipe and tabba, um, in its main surviving continental forms are um, the Chistu or Chirula in the Basque country, the Flaviola Bombo in Catalonia, the uh, Galoube and Tambran in Provence, and uh, various names, <laughs> um, but the Flauta and Tambril in uh, Eastern, uh, Western uh, Spain and in Portugal. They're all played in the same way, 
for the many and varied dance steps in their traditions, a tradition of playing for dance that's continuous since the 15th century when the primary dance instrument in the courts of Europe was a pipe and tabba. Carlos Mass, the leading exponent of the pipe and tabba for European historical and folk dance, runs a famous course that all professional tabras in the continent, uh, across the continent attend. He teaches with a technique passed down to him from the old players, playing the footfalls. You spend very little time in his week-long course on the tunes. He takes them for granted. All of the course is spent dancing, feeling the rhythms, watching dancers' feet and beating those rhythms. You actually learn to beat the rhythms as you dance, holding the tabba in your hand. Keith Chandler comments that as far as the dancers were concerned, the tune was subservient to the rhythm. Not for nothing are we called tabaras, not pipers. So how important was this? When it came to the collection of tunes, Cecil Sharp noted that many old Morris men have told us they gave up dancing when the pipe and tabba was su superseded by the fiddle because they found it impossible to dance to the latter instrument. And it is a pity that of all the original dancers that were met in the great days of collecting Morris dances and tunes, not one record, one tabra was recorded to wax disc or cylinder. <clears throat> it should have been possible Joe Powell of Bucknell, Bucknell was the last surviving Tabra. Have I got him here? There he is. Um, uh, tabra. But several of the fiddlers could also play pipe and Tabra, including William Hathaway and Charles Benfield. It isn't to say they didn't try. Joe Powell no longer had his pipe, and one of the collectors uh, brought him a pipe to, so that he could demonstrate how it was played, but he could not play it. And it's not until 2001 at the Tabra's um, International Pipe and Tabra Festival we understood why. Richard Sermon, then the city archaeologist, had tracked down uh, with the help of other people and brought to uh, the festival the original pipe and tabba from Joe Pohl um, from the different di lines of his descendants. And uh, I think all that is well recorded on the uh, perhaps the Morris Fed website. Anyway. And it's also on the Tabra Society website. Um, examining these instruments was quite revealing. Pohl's tabo pipe did not have the standard English tabo pipe tuning determined by the intervals when one opens the finger holes. The standard tuning goes tone, tone, semitone. However, the Pohl pipe went tone, tone, three quarters of a tone. A very odd mode indeed. And uh, when we were able to examine that pipe in detail, we discovered that um, he was using half holing technique to pinch the hole with his thumbnail. And there was a deep groove on that thumbnail. So if he was given a standard TTS pipe to play by one of the collectors, he actually wouldn't know how to play it. As he played it, it wouldn't have worked. Um, so that not the only thing we, we, we learned from that, but there's, there's all kinds of other stuff about um, uh, 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 the unusual tunings of pipes. Um, and um, I'm just going to move on a little bit here. Um, we do have the recordings <coughs> of several <coughs> source players. However, on fiddle, and um, in particular here, on the left here, a photo from Cambridge Morris Men of Jinky Wells. And I quite like to play uh, a bit of him uh, playing here. <laughs> Now, um, people often say it sounds, um, the recordings of these people are, are quite, sound quite primitive, lacking tone or technique, <laughs> recording quality aside. Uh, we get the same thing from John Robbins of Bidford and my favorite Stephen Baldwin of Clifford's Mean. But as Chandler, Keith Chandler points out, rhythm was often accented, often at the expense of tonal purity. Bertie Clark, another fiddler at Bampton was described um, uh, his performance described as almost a succession of grunts and squeals welded together by a wealth of blue notes into a wildly rhythmic pattern. Um, and uh, 
that might seem quite a, a strange thing to say. Uh, well, you know, he may have been quite a primitive musician, but actually Bertie Clark was um, a trained uh, violinist in the classical um, method, um, but he labored to get the rhythm out of the instrument. At times they experimented by having a drum or tambourine played along with the fiddle in an attempt to re reproduce the all important rhythmic qualities. However, the cost of paying for two musicians proved uneconomic. As well as playing the pipe and tabber, I play Anglo for Morris, and I learned by listening to the recordings of William Kimber. He used great fistfuls of note to emphasize the rhythm. And uh, we see him, let me move this uh, outside, uh, on the right here with his fabulous concertina. And we can hear a bit of him, uh, a bit of him playing Lord and Bunches. <laughs> Um, Dan Worrell uh, wrote a, pr produced a book of Kimber transcriptions, allowing us to analyze the style. In particular, in the, in the single step dances, he emphasizes the step with a staccato chord, whilst he did emphasize or um, not emphasize or sometimes did not play the hops at all. Um, it's quite at odds with the modern umpa methods that you get with recordings. I've got, um, who have I got here? Um, Brian Holman. Uh, where, uh, as traditional with, um, with uh, piano accordions, people play a bass note on the first note and then a chord, which sort of emphasizes the second note. Um, William Kimber very much emphasized the first note. His staccato technique was the closest thing you could get to a drum beat on, an, on a concertina. And there are examples where you find him playing that one, two, three pause uh, aspect that uh, Chandler noted. Um, another observation is that Dan makes, uh, that Dan makes to Kimber is his crude approach to harmony. And my analysis of Dan's transcriptions and recordings is that Kimber doesn't choose the most obvious chordal harmonies to go with the melody. He goes for the chord that gives him the most oomph. Rhythm is king. But we move on now to um, the, uh, the revival. Cecil Sharp did a lot of collecting and was well acquainted with the pipe and tabba. He wasn't very enamored with the instrument. He observed of the tunes we have noted down from the fiddlers, only a few are, being, are capable of being played on the more ancient instrument. An interesting observation and a common misconception. Um, I mentioned them before that a good pipe can get an octave and a half easily, and there are very few tunes with a larger range, and all the tunes can be played on the pipe and tabba. In fact, uh, people have noted how beautifully the collected tunes fit the instrument, indicating that perhaps the instrument was the was instrumental in the selections of tunes. Tunes like Lumps of Plum Pudding and Dearest Dicky, which I've often heard as indicative of the importance of the fiddle in the Morris repertoire, just fall out of the tabo pipe, um, despite the large range. I asked Keith Chandler about these tunes because they're um, uh, popular in the Fieldtown repertoire, and he had traced them back to the Dorr family of, the, of Tabras in Finstock. And um, uh, yes, and even though they were Fieldtown known and collected as Fieldtown tunes, they came from Finstock and were played by the Tabras of Finstock. Sharp and his friends, however, did promote the pipe and tabra, and people like Mary Neal and Helen Kennedy and Joan Sharp were proficient on the instrument. And it often appears in photos of Sharp and early revivalists dancing. Now, with this photo, I'm moving on to the focus to Cambridge. The university was a significant loci in the early revival. In particular, there were members of many members of the Travelling Morris, founded in 1924. And this is the troupe of mostly academics who danced its way across England, visiting the places where Sharp and his friends had been collecting. They took the dances back to the villages where they'd died out. In many cases, they'd died out not long before, and some of the old guys were still alive, enabling them to learn more about the dances and the tunes, the music from the men who transmitted them in the first place. 
they collected more dances, more tunes, more context, and more nuances direct from the sources. Ten years later, one of the travelling Morris, a soil scientist by the name of Kenworthy Schofield, proposed they form the Cambridge Morris Men. The idea was originally a dining club at which to discuss, discuss Morris matters, but was soon performing around the area. And they included um, Kenworthy Schofield, Joseph Needham, Arthur Peck and Nicholas Probin. And uh, Schofield, Peck, Probin and Needham are shown in this photo from that period. Within a year, Peck and Needham identified the need for a larger umbrella organisation to bring together the other clubs that were developing at the time. They instigated meetings that led to the formation of the ring with Alec Hunter as squire. Kenworthy Schofield was a Cambridge soil scientist, Morris dancer and tabra and became the second squire of the ring in 36. A few years later, a few years earlier, Schofield was invited to join the English Folk Dance Society on a folk dance tour in the Basque country, led by uh, Mary Neal and Arthur Peck, which also included Violet Afford. Um, and here we can see in uh, the Basque country, there is um, Schofield playing on the corner of uh, the dance square there, but he is playing uh, an interesting instrument. He is playing a Basque chistu rather than a tabor pipe and he's playing a Basque tabor. Um, now in the Basque country there are, there are dance traditions where men wear whites, ribbons, bells and they dance the pipe and tabor. Um, <clears throat> and um, it is a classy tabor pipe, much more sexy than the battered wooden instruments that Schofield had seen in England. And we can see uh, the tabras of San Sebastian here at the uh, Pipe and Tabor Festival in Gloucester I think in 2001. You can see these instruments are beautifully made instruments and lovely tabbers. Very different from our tabbers, um, the, the traditional narrow tabber uh, that was played in the 19th century. These are deep tabbers and, um, and the pipes there are actually quite a bit longer than the standard high D pipe that was common for the Morris. Um, however, aesthetically, they were rather attractive and perhaps looked more like Thomas Sly's instrument from the woodcut with Will Pe Kemp. Kenworthy Schofield bought, brought back a tabber from the, uh, from the Basque country and used it for the rest of his life. And um, uh, he uh, took up a post at Rothamsted Agricultural Establishment in Harpenden near St Albans and joined the St Albans Morris Men. He persuaded a friend, I think his name was David Taylor, to fabricate a brass tabor pipe of similar dimensions to the Basque type pipe. Played with his Basque tabba, he created a new pipe and tabba instrument for Britain. And I actually wonder if these two brass pipes, uh, these were in the collection of, um, uh, of uh, Graham Lyndon Jones when he died. Uh, a team member, um, took up the challenge to uh, produce a frame to construct deep tabbers and started experimenting with brass tubing. Um, and soon several more members were playing in the image of Kenworthy Schofield, who not only created a new sound, but new pattern, new style of playing. Um, and um, here on the left is uh, Schofield with his Basque pipe and his uh, new English system long towel pipe and uh, here we've got you might recognize Mike Chandler on the right um, playing that same uh, tabber that uh, was owned by Schofield and in the middle is a rather poor photo of Graham Lyndon Jones who actually uh, cared for the tabla tabber um, after Schofield's death and was playing there one of Bill Warder's um, brass pipes. <clears throat> but the interesting thing is they played a fairly strict tempo and I'm going to give you a bit of that now. Uh, this is um, uh, Kenworthy Schofield. <laughs> A 
very strict tempo pattern of dancing, uh, of playing, <clears throat> which was very much unlike the kind of uh, sound that we heard from the uh, original players. Kenworth Schofield died in 1960, by which time he moved on to Oxford University, but he had kicked off an important revival of the pipe and tabba. He was only 59 years old when he died. And sadly, Bill Warder, the pipe and tabba maker, was also taken from us young. By now, but by now there was a growing demand for pipe and tabba. And um, uh, Jim Jones, a St Albans dancer and bus driver, took over pipe production, firstly in brass and solder, but he moved on to stainless steel production, eventually making sets in GNA with a common headstock and later a high CD. He later moved to Forest of Dean and production was vastly improved with the help of Forest of Dean dancer Dave Blick, who devised a number of jigs to streamline the production. Um, using Bill Warder's formers, Mike Chandler took up the challenge of tabber making. And if anybody has a deep, uh, uh, well, there's loads of these uh, tabbers that uh, Mike Chandler made uh, based on the original formers copying the Bass tabber. Now at this point, I'd like to introduce another Cambridge Morris dancer and it's first, the first squire of Cambridge Morris men, and that's Russell Wortley. Russell was also an academic, 11 years younger than Schofield, and was also researching in agriculture, but not in soil science. He was looking at plant physiology and was awarded his doctorate in 38 and continued the rest of his career at the Potato Virus Institute in Cambridge and dancing with Cambridge Morris men. As a member of the Travelling Morris, he was active in collecting, and in particular, he focused on the Forest of Dean tunes. He recorded Stephen Baldwin and Beatrice Hill of Bromsborough Heath. Like Schofield, he took up the pipe and tabba, but unlike Schofield, he didn't invent his own style. He researched how the old guys played. Um, and um, I've got an example here of... Um, uh, Russell Wortley playing. I think you can hear the one, two, three, one, two, three, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. Um, so um, I mentioned before, um, well, uh, he collected tunes, dances and songs, but importantly, he collected that technique. It is, uh, it is one thing to be able to play a tune and listen to a tune and beat a tabber at time with it. However, that isn't why the owl dancers loved the long gone pipe and tabber players. It's because they did something different. They played for the lead dancer. They watched his feet like a hawk. And um, we mentioned playing the footfalls not just any old footfalls. Old tabblers would play the lead dancer's footfalls and that meant they played a quite a long linear rhythm. And when I uh, went to a workshop with Russell Wortley, um, he quite berated me for straightening out the rhythm. <laughs> he said, they spend longer in the air there. Um, the double step is not exactly a 4-4 four, four or 6-8, it is micro -docted. And when a dancer does a feet together jump, they're in the air for longer than a beat. The tempo changes within the bar. However, the old collectors like Cecil Sharp, when they made their notations, they wrote in straight common time signatures. The reality for Wortley was a symbiotic interplay between the dancer and the music being played for the lead dancer. He was communicating exactly the lead dancer's rhythm to the other members in the set. Um, in the light of this knowledge, I'd like to repeat Jinky Wells' memories. They used to play much slower on the whittle and dub. It was very beautiful. You could grasp every moment. The old style of dancing was much the best, and it's a pity the old much loved wit and dub couldn't be brought back and its wonderful players. Um, there were very significant differences between the Schofield and the Wortley schools of tabbering, and these were apparent to me when I started learning in the 70s. I started with Mike Chandler, Graham Lyndon Jones, St Albans, and playing just like Schofield with strict tempo and uh, the drags and the ornamentations. And um, 
But by contrast, when I went to uh, a workshop at Cambridge with Russell Wortley, I learned to watch the dancer and play exactly to his feet. And uh, so I learned a different way. And ever since then, I've played in that manner. Wortley realized that if the pipe and tabble was to continue, then people needed an instrument to be easily available. To rectify the lack of instruments, he persuaded Boozy and Hawks to make a variation of their ubiquitous D tin whistle the, and uh, invented the generation tabble pipe. That tabble pipe is still available today. It's a fine working instrument for dance and it's a real instrument for only £9.99. Many people say it's far too shrill, but you're missing the point. Pipe and tabber is our last remaining outdoor instrument tradition. It isn't meant to be played indoors. It's meant to be heard over a distance. Schofield reinvented the tabble pipe and brought us the deep tabber and the long pipe. And um, to him, it was perhaps a more aesthetic instrument, a more aesthetic aspect. In my book, both of these people are great men. But roll on 45 years, and I look around the Morris scene now, there are very few tablers left of those two old schools. The Schofield pattern is still well discernible. And there are many players who swear by their Jim no Jones stainless steel pipes and their Chandler deep tabbers as the traditional Morris instrument. There are but a handful of Wortley School tabbers, and notably those that came up through the Cambridge Morris men. And Andy Richards, I see very much as part of that living part of that line that goes all the way back to the old dead guys. However, there are plenty of good musicians who play a strict tempo for Morris, somewhat akin to the Schofield attempt uh, uh, approach on a whole variety of instruments. There are many excellent dancers who also watch the dancers carefully and play melodeon or concertina or accordion in the manner that Wortley would definitely identify with, especially for jigs. For me, it's a joy to see the likes of Mark Rogers, Richard Owersmith, Johnny Spires, Will Pound, Chris Cook down in Devon, absolutely nailing it for playing for one of their athletic jig dancers. And to see Richard playing for Pexerton, he and his instrument dance every microsecond of the way. Mary Jo Searle is a tabra with the new Esperance Morris, phenomenal musician in the mold of Mary Neal and Russell Wortley. I hear the beat of her tabra, her tabber, and I know she is absolutely clear what she is doing. Um, so how did these musicians get to play in this Wortley school or the Schofield school, either strict tempo or footfall? I'm sure many players today on different instruments have no concept or knowledge of the story that these two men existed or have heard their names. Uh, St Albans and Cambridge both used to have a convention of only one musician playing at a time. Uh, so they both have a tradition and through that new musicians pick up the method by osmosis. But is one method better than the other? If they both be, give a good performance, perhaps not. But I may be biased. When I see a performance that, uh, that stops me on my tracks, open mouthed, they're nearly always dancing to something like a workly style. However, these schools, these methods are in the minority. Most people have no idea there is a method. Uh, they mostly teach themselves to play for Morris. They're often recruited because the side like in the 19th century, is desperate for a musician. They will take anyone. Hey, the tunes are easy. You'll pick them up easy enough. Can you come out with us next Thursday? They are not to blame if their playing lacks any style or direction. But there are others who should know better. A couple of years ago, I was watching a Cotswold side. There was a row of nine melodians and concertinas. These were old musicians. When they got too old to dance, and not being able to dance every dance, they would pick up a melodeon. And most are happy if they can play the tune all the way through without making a mistake. The left hand holds the bass and chord buttons down, the bellows go in and out, volume is the thing, and there is no definable rhythm. It's as though Schofield and Wortley never existed. The tune is smeared up and down the line. The man at one end is playing faster than the one at the other end because they can't hear each other. And none of them is looking in the direction of the dancers. So um, I think there's perhaps a number of things for discussion. 
whoops, uh, I was just moving on here. Um, uh, Morris um, music has a history and we have lots of tunes in the Black Book. And the Black Book is very dear to me. I was a, uh, very uh, fortunate to be a member of Winchester and I used to love playing with um, Lionel Bacon. And he was <laughs> very clear about what he wanted me to play. Um, he, he played the fiddle, but he said he preferred the beat of the type pipe and tabaral, so we played together. Um, but whilst the tunes are in the Black Book, the methodology is available through the recordings and uh, the tabaras. Now, um, I'm gonna hand over to Andy at this point. Um, uh, and uh, he's gonna do some playing and uh, uh, demonstrating with uh, uh, some things. And um, then if you want to um, put uh, questions through from the chat, uh, on the chat, you can do so through the, uh, through the chat there. You can put them through to me there. And uh, if I hand over to Andy, yeah. Hey, well, it's great to see uh, all of you here and uh, lots of people um, who I've seen in, in different situations. Um, yeah, so uh, Steve's been talking about um, talking about the different um, ways of playing and I'm sure various of us have been inspired by different, different people over the years. Um, so yeah, I was very much uh, inspired by, by Russell Wortley in, in the 1970s, um, Cambridge Morris. Uh, it was just phenomenal to dance to his playing, uh, really fantastic, and um, and uh, so yeah, it was great to uh, to to discuss with him how to do tabering, and and he he had interviewed um, Joe Pole, who was the last nineteenth century taborer. So that was um, that was a, a wonderful thing um, to be involved in. Um, <clears throat> so. Yeah, that link to Bucknell is is a fantastic thing because it's kind of unbroken. They they always had pipe and tabor and and they always had really quite an interesting dance style. Um, so yeah, if, if you want to listen to uh, um, Russell Wortley, he's he's on the uh, the Ring um, Bucknell CD. Um, so half of it is him, half of it is me, um, and um, what I can do now is um, give you just a little bit of a taster. This is already tasters looking forward to uh, our beginners workshop we got on the on the twentieth of March, five o'clock, um, where you can all have a go at, at uh, a Bucknell Shepherd's Hay, learning that tune on on a on a, a tabor pipe. Um, you won't need uh, you won't need a very expensive tabor. You can have a you know a piece of cardboard or something tied to your tied to your arm and uh, and hit it with um, a wooden spoon uh, if the mother-in-law isn't available. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, that that workshop is two weeks time, so you've got time to uh, to get hold of uh, of a tabor pipe, and there are links on how to do that. Um, in the uh, in the event details on on the Morris Federation um, website. So what I want to do now is just um, just show you um, show you a video of of uh, some some Bucknell tabering. So this is a little bit of a precursor of the sort of thing you can get into with pipe and tabor, um, trying to uh, trying to lift the dancers. So I'm just going to share screen. I'm quite bumbling at sharing screen. So bear with me. And you might see somebody who you know when, if I can get it to work. Hang on a second. So here's Ollie. So, so that was Ollie um, doing an upright caper. Let me just sort of show you um, the kind of way that you can actually do that tabering. That that was a very poor recording of me um, me playing for him. So this this tabor is um, is similar to the ones that um, that we used at Bucknell. Uh, it's got a snare on the struck side. Um, so what 
what you're trying to do as a as a taborer is you're basically trying to tabor to the footfalls, as as Steve was saying, uh, and emphasise. Um, in Bucknell, you have these very sharp arm movements in the in the uh, uh, thing things like foot up, um, crossover, those kind of movements. So you're trying to emphasise those, and uh, and it's such fun to uh, to really emphasise the uprights and the other capers. This is so. This is how you would em emphasise that upright caper. So, <clears throat> so that's just a little a little taste of um, of how you actually do that kind of thing. Um, so I'm really hoping that um, lots of you can just ha really have a go at uh, learning learning Tabor Pipe, Shepherd's Hay, Bucknell. Um, Steve is going to put a video on uh, on the Tabor Society YouTube channel uh, of Shepherd's Hay, Bucknell, and it'll be nice and slow, and then dance speed, so you can see exactly how to do the uh, the playing. So uh, I'm sort of really hoping to uh, see as many of you as possible on that. Right, um, I think that's all I've got to say about um, tabering for dance lift. Um, I'm just going to, we've got some questions coming in, I'm very pleased to see. Um, I'm just going to um, share uh, a little screen to um, perhaps provoke some more questions really. Firstly, um, you know, dancers or musicians amongst the audience were you aware that there is uh, there are methodologies for playing um and that these methodologies are a part of the intangible cultural heritage how we dance something and how we play something is different from the actual recorded document of um Cecil Sharp writing it down so to speak music has become a culture of the Morris side uh, with someone like Cambridge or St Albans playing, one musician playing at a time um, uh, means that they have a consistent culture of how to play for it. Whereas uh, there are other sides where um, uh, anybody can come and play and um, especially if it's a spouse of one of the dancers. Um, <clears throat> is the quality of the music important? Is the quality of the dance important? Um, or is it more important that it's a social gathering? Um, strict tempo or follow the footfalls or what do you do? And does anyone really care? So um, <laughs> I got one here from Norm. Um, Steve, I missed the first five minutes, but I don't recall you mentioning four hole pipes. No, I didn't. <clears throat> I didn't mention... Um, uh, nine hole pipes either. <laughs> um, uh, in, um, in Catalonia, there's a one handed pipe that has nine finger holes. Um, but um, I can hold up here. Uh, this is, uh, this is, well, I've got several of them here, but this, this is a bit battered actually, but this is one of the um, uh, Jim Jones pipes. Um, it, it needs a new hook on there. But um, one of the added features of these new pipes in the Schofield pattern was to add um, uh, a little finger hole so that you can uh, act and a loop to hold the instrument. I've got one here with a loop like this. So you can do that and you can actually get the um, uh, leading note below the root note of the instrument. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, is there a good Mervyn Kerwood Ask, is there a good how to play booklet? Um, there are two. There's, I think you can still get hold of Russell Wortley's How to Play the Pipe and Tabber, <laughs> uh, which is a leaflet. Um, but there is a book by Dick Bagwell, um, which is which is quite good and contains a lot of stuff. There is also um, on the YouTube channel of the Tabra Society, you'll find a number of um, beginners workshops featuring. Andy, <clears throat> and um, one or two uh, that I've put up there, and we're adding to that all the time. We are currently developing a syllabus to help people um, <clears throat> learn and progress, have a clear direction progress. Um, so there we go. 
Hello, Dawn Sky. Is your Bill Water Tabber of any interest, or did Graham leave a few? Um, Bill Water Tabbers are always of interest. I love my Bill Water Tabber, and um, very, very proud to have it. <clears throat> and I think there would be others. Uh, there are always people, and we we tend to have a maker's market or instrument market at the Pipe and Tabber Festival. So if you do want to make sure it goes to a good tabbering home, then uh, that would be, uh, there are definitely people who would love that. Um, Norm says, what about taping up the top three holes of a six hole whistle? Um, well, um, let me see if I can find a six hole whistle. Oh, look here, I've got a six hole whistle with the top three holes taped up. <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't put on original sound there. <clears throat> we did hear it, Steve. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, Helen Mitchum says, I learned from Russell's book given to me by Chris White, price sixpence, and played for Mr. Joe Hop Morris. That's, Fantastic. That is how I started. I had his little leaflet um, and, and, and lots of encouragement from Graham Lyndon Jones and, and uh, Mike Chandler. Uh, tips on how to practice indoors and remain alive. Well, <clears throat> one tip is to half cover the window um, with either tape or a bit of blue tack, and that decreases the volume. And um, <clears throat> an instrument like the um, Jim Jones pipe, I've got one here, uh, very cleverly has a flattened out um, fipple here, and that gives a very wide window and a much louder signal sound. Uh, the um, generation pipe is quieter and you can make it quieter still. Uh, there is a guy in the States who produces a tweaked window, uh, tweaked one, which has got an even smaller bore and, uh, and window. It's easier to get the higher notes on that as well. <clears throat> Yeah, so basically, uh, I think quite a lot of people end up um, having an outdoor instrument and an indoor instrument. Um, yeah. If they, if they have a, par a partner who doesn't like the idea of the outdoor instrument being played a lot indoors. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I love playing the uh, uh, Generation Tabble Pipe, and I played this uh, really for most of my Morris playing career until I was able to get hold of some Jim Jones pipes, which I really love. Uh, but also I play through the through the um, Pipe and Tabber Festival. We've been able to encourage more makers. And this one is from Morven Minstrelsy, Tim Cranmore, a top recorder maker. And these are beautiful instruments made of plum and cherry with a beautiful sound. And he also makes Great whoppers like this, <laughs> based <laughs> on the Mary Rose pipe. You've got a quiet collection there, haven't you, Andy? Yeah, I just need to mention the fact that um, I've got one uh, by Barry Lloyd that's uh, made out of purple heartwood. So it actually is purple, and it's um, it's really nice indoor instrument. So even Fizz can 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 uh, survive if I if I play this. <laughs> yeah, and that's a lovely indoor sound, isn't it? It wouldn't cut it outdoors. You want no. a louder pipe for that. Um, Judith says, uh, well, never played Tabba for Morris, but when playing Constantine for broom dances, I always play to the footfall. Right on, Judith. <laughs> Why do you pronounce it Tabba? What is the rationale? Um, this is one of these things, Andy and I will disagree about it, but you do find linguistic evidence, and uh, you... When you find um, tabras uh, mentioned in the records, they're often written T A double -B, B, and so and T A double -B, B E R often uh, comes up for tabber. So it's a bit like a waysail and wassail. Um, modern, you know, practice is you look at the word and you say what W A W S was, but when you look at uh, how Vaughan Williams recorded it and wrote it down in his notebooks. He wrote it down W A Y S A I L from people. Waysail. Um, the Gloucestershire Waysail 
is definitely way sale. Uh, but <laughs> <clears throat> people pronounce yeah. it differently now, don't they? <laughs> they do. I, I think there's uh, yeah, there's two schools now. I think it, there, there seems to be some evidence that originally um, all of these words with uh, with a uh, uh, you know a bit like Haberer or or Faber or things like that were actually they weren't actually quite as short as Haberer and Faber. They were sort of halfway between the two. And it's probably quite difficult now for us to, unless we've got a regional accent, to get that yeah. down halfway between the two. So <laughs> we all end up playing one or the other. It doesn't really matter. The thing is, because it's uh, kind of an endangered instrument, uh, kind of every Tabor just kind of loves every other Tabor. Every <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter how they pronounce it. I, I mentioned earlier that, um, that that this this is a discussion that goes on in other parts of the world, and uh, this is the flaviol or flabiol, and um, uh, this comes from Catalonia, and it's a one-handed instrument that has loads of holes on it, and it is a devilish instrument to play. Um, you've got this strange thing where you play this finger, little finger, this hole. It's a it's a devilish instrument. Anyway, um, Clive Dumont says, I presume that's Clive Dumont. It just says Clive D here. <clears throat> Mike C, I presume that's Chandler, tells how the early Bill Water tablers, if memory serves, were made from cheese boxes. In fact, we there are some examples of tablers that were made from cheese boxes, and I have one here. Where is it? Yeah. So um, Joe Pole actually made some. Um, yeah, uh, which are um, they're which are still, still around. Yeah, yeah still excellent. Um, I think one of them is held by Mark Perkins in Cambridge, Morris. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the thing about a cheese box was that, that the lid was a greater diameter than the uh, shell of the box, and so the lid made the hoops for the um, for the flesh hoops, and the sh shell, the inner part, made the shell. <clears throat> and I've seen some of those. This one comes from La Gomera in the Canary Islands. Um, not many people have been there. It's a, it's a good starting point if you're going to row across the Atlantic. Um, but um, this one is made in the same way from a sardine box. And the narrower diameter bit in the middle was the base of the box. And these were um, two lids that were used to make the hoops. Um, is there a problem with tuning as the generation that range have fixed heads? Um, look, if you're playing on your own, what's the problem? <laughs> no, yeah, I, but yeah. <clears throat> seriously, is, there is a is question quite, about that. It's quite an interesting point, the, the whole thing of, um, you know, do you have a solo musician or, or do you have more than one? I think it's, it's partly a belief system partly a cultural thing people different people will have different ideas about it um so yeah if i play for cambridge or for, or for pilgrim i I'll, I'll be a solo taborer um if i play for um for taylor's morris then then i i will sometimes deploy this which is a, it's a tunable um mark finn's pipe in g so i can be in tune with john watcham <laughs> <laughs> but we we have a we have a rule of pretty much we limit that setup to three of us obsessively making sure we're absolutely together uh, and following the number one dancer. But yeah, when, it's an interesting yeah. debating point, isn't it? And when you buy a generation pipe when they're new, um, it's possible to dip the end in boiling water and free the end and tune it and. Uh, as I said, there are tweaked ones from the States which are tunable. Um, Graham Lyndon Jones did a workshop in 2000 and something, and I still have the booklet. I'd love to see that. <laughs> um, uh, bunch of wastrels. Here we go. <laughs> tabba, tabba, tabba. Train the sardines. Train the sardines to tell you. There we go. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Yes, if the tabra is playing to the lead dancer, the dancer is leading the tune and the musician is following the tabra. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's a symbiosis between the two. And you are watching so carefully to bang that, that, that exact footfall. Um, 
Stephanie Goodacre. Hello, Stephanie. Said, <laughs> did somebody say they have a tab off a scale? Uh, that was Dawn Sky. Perhaps we can do a bit of matchmaking there. <laughs> um, so um, I just wondered if there were any questions in relation to the points that um, I put up there. Um, were you aware there was any musicians? How did you learn? Were you aware there was a methodology? Is there a culture in your Morris side? Do people, um, you know, do they let anybody play? Um, how do you recruit musicians? Um, are you aware if you play for strict tempo or do you do something else? Um, and do you care? <laughs> Um, perhaps uh, Pauline with this if anybody raises their hands we can um, we can uh, get them in to talk about it yeah sure so if anybody wants to raise their hand rather than um, uh, put a note in the chat please do so or just simply unmute yourself and ask a question I noticed we got some good tabras there's David Moore there hello David <laughs> <laughs> What do, you, what do you do, David? Yes. Uh, hi, Stephen. Um, I, I play for the Atterbury Morris, and I, um, I follow the dancers. I follow the, the, the lead musician. But I don't always, depending on the, the, um, the tune I'm playing for, I don't always do the strict one, two, three, and then pause. Sometimes I put a little roll in um, in the, in the, the, the hop. Yeah. Uh, but, but certainly... A stronger beat on the one, two, three. The other thing that that, that may be worth um, thoughts on is what to do when the dancers are standing still and sticking. I tend to just follow the stick with a fairly light beat. But is there a is there a um, protocol on that, or do you just stop playing, or do you just stop playing the tabor and just play the the the, the pipe? I, I think I think personally, it's um, it's very much dependent on the tradition. So so I I I I I've been giving some lessons actually on playing for different traditions on, on pipe and tabor recently, and it's kind of forced me to analyse what I've been doing in the different traditions, and um, and it, it forces you to actually think that. Uh, for example, in Bucknell, you, you really don't have any any of these um, anacrusis bounces you know if somebody jumps they land and then they go into the next step and so you sort of honor that in your tabering you kind of do the lift the land you, there's no little bounce that you might have say in Bampton or in Fieldtown um, you don't have that um, yeah in Bampton or in Fieldtown um, you, you tend to have this like little bounce as people land and therefore I I always tabor that because there's a reason for it, because, because the dancers are then moving into something else that is helping them to surge into the next movement. So, yeah, I've been fairly obsessively kind of analyzing all of those things. It, it, it's interesting because I, I found I didn't really change anything because I've always been just obsessively following the feet. But it's interesting to actually kind of write it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, it, I... You know, I, I, it was a revelation to me when I went to that. The workshop I went to with Russell Wortley wasn't a tabering workshop. It, it was a Morris workshop with the Cambridge, I think it was for the, not the Cambridge Folk Festival, but the Folk Festival in Cambridge, if you know what I mean. <laughs> About 1975, but I went along with my tabber and, um, uh, you know, uh, he let me play. Uh, which was which was lovely, and he berated me for filling in the bits that shouldn't be filled in. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and, and, uh, like that. But still, um, uh, Mitchell Mitchell Keeley, do you want to unmute? Had a question there. Yeah, sure thing. I think it's fairly well covered by what's been said already, actually. But yeah, are there any specific kind of particular rhythmic figures you'd like to use to support those uh, specific motions of the dances, or is it more done by feel? Is it more kind of just like depending how you're on on the day? I think, you know, as, as a taverer, you've, you've definitely got some, you know, you've got some sort of uh, personality that you can, you can put in there. So, um, so you do, you do get some situations where you, you you've got some decisions to make. So for example, um, 
uh, let's say a hand, uh, a, a dance that's got some hand clapping in there. Um, do you want to sort of um, have no tabering so that there's a very, very clear, uh, obvious difference between, <clears throat> between this clapping section and the section where people are dancing? <clears throat> do you want to kind of support the clapping that they're doing? Um, you get that kind of issue as well in, in some of the some of the sort of um, dances involving sticking as well. It's something like, let's say, um, Bows of London City, Atterbury, you, you've got a decision to make. Do you just, <clears throat> on those corners where they're advancing to each other and then clashing, do you kind of make that very, very different from all the movements and, and just play it on the pipe? Because you can get a lot of you get a lot of impetus on from the pipe by um, by putting in um, trills and um, and having very uh, very good um, staccato playing, um, or, or do you do you support what they're doing with with the tabor? So I, I think it's <clears throat> there are lots of areas where it's very much a personal choice, and um, and, and when you get down to some of the really detailed stuff. Um, You've got issues like um, double step, for example. I, I think I think the way that different taborers tabor for double step, um, it, it, it can be quite different. But as long as as long as they're kind of being obsessed by the dancer and trying to really support what the dancer is doing, um, I think that there are actually different ways of of tabering for double step. So if, if you if you went to that button or CD and you and you you listened to to me playing for double step, and you listen to Russell playing for double step, the, the technique is different. Um, <clears throat> and I, I just I just love dancing to his technique, but I, but I wouldn't want to play exactly the same. Um, so I think it's all about being dance obsessed and finding your way of lifting and supporting the dancers. Yeah, I find um, the thing I find interesting is. Yeah, I, I moved around the country a lot and also danced around the world, you know, different places. Um, and uh, I was with Winchester for quite a while. And Winchester's Bledington is so slow that you actually, well, you have to hang in the air for quite a while uh, before coming to coming down. And and uh, with the with the tabba, you can really stretch it. I also play um, Anglo and I and, and I learned Anglo by listening to Kimber and Kimber, Kimber's left hand on the Anglo. If I've got one, to, oh, there's loads of them around here, but I've got one that's a bit, a bit easier to demonstrate with. Um, maybe one of these. <laughs> um, his left hand is really sharp. In fact, he's playing the chords on left hand, right, and it's a beat. And... Um, you know, I, 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 I find that, you know, I never play a chord for, for its harmonic thing. I'm always looking for that beat. And um, it, in some dances, you know, it's really distinctive about how you, how you play a double set. Um, obviously, uh, Sherborne. I love playing pipe and tabba for Sherborne um, because you, uh, it, it, it is non, it isn't strict tempo. It's nothing like um the the six eight that's that's written on the page um it, it is it is stretched and with a pipe and tabby you can get that and the dancers just love it when you do that you know it's it's just just falls out of it yeah um we've got some more questions here um sue e our foreman has always said that musicians should watch the squire's feet squire's feet <laughs> i agree with that <laughs> we're sometimes <laughs> lucky enough to have a tabra and dancing to him is wonderful um uh there's an interesting way to play for bampton with ditchling with a lot of bounce support with a tabba um yeah and there's a, a youtube video link there from norman <laughs> warren um yeah i mean there are what uh, particularly single steps and things like that getting the, the 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 bounce out of it there's lots of ways of doing it um i i i remember dancing with a side which had a uh uh a piano accordion whose left hand style was and it 
we, <laughs> nobody ever knew where the beat was. You couldn't tell where the beat was, but the harmonies were a lot better than that. Actually, the harmonies were always beautiful and inventive. And, you know, it was a question is, well, the music, the, the, the music and the harmonies he's creating are wonderful. And that is part of the performance. Um, it's quite leaden to dance to. And we'd dance into the ground rather than out of the ground. Um, and there is a there is quite a umchik sort of with a, um, country dance players tend to go umchik and sort of lift the the bounce on the on the jig, uh, which you can do on the pipe and tabba, but you do actually need to note where that first footfall is because that's the important one for the dancer, uh, which is which is different from a, a country dance uh, setting. Uh, so it is a subtle thing. And there, there are different ways of, of hitting the tabor as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, it's entirely possible to, to hit a tabor in a way that sort of shoves somebody into the ground as well. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, perhaps, yeah, perhaps I think, you are also endangering the skin as well if you're sort of like, you know, keeping the, keeping the, um, the stick, you know, too present on, on the on the skin yeah. So, yeah i think i think there's a good example of that i was at a um uh at a morris gathering and um i could hear this sound there was lots of morris sides around and i was walking up up the street and i could hear the sound of a a, 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 a side playing at the cross and um well i could hear a little bit of the of the melody um but i could hear this drum beat but it wasn't a regular drum beat. It was. <laughs> it was like a sort of a slow Geiger counter. And um, I got up there and I was watching the side dance. And um, the guy on the drum was just hitting it. Um, <laughs> no relation to anything they were playing or anything they were dancing. He was just hitting the drum. And he was he was a husband of one of the dancers and um and that was his role um and you know uh so we had a rule then in our side never give a drum to someone who can't dance uh, <laughs> because the drum is the important bit um now mitchell again keely mitchell um how do you manage subdivisions in slower dances is it distracting to add in quavers and semi quavers does it support the momentum of the dancers is it too difficult to accomplish when the meter is flexible for the footfall following? That is an interesting point because yeah, so I, yeah, yeah, I think um, that, that it's it, it's it's quite interesting, and that comes back to what I was saying earlier about you, you you're going to have some different interpretations of how to do this kind of stuff. Um, and but do you ever it, think of quavers and semi quavers? Well, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't think of quavers and semi quavers. I, I because I I'm so dance obsessed that you know if, if anybody ever has a pipe and table lesson with me it's always based upon a dance and it's always starting with you know okay how do we how do we express these you know the what's going on in the dance so if you've got a slow galley then you, you start thinking about right well okay if i'm executing a slow galley what do i feel like and so and so i i i personally would 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 end up um, doing doing a sort of a, a role where you're, you're trying to maintain the interest of of the dancers and and the musicians, and you're you're trying to keep that sort of pulsing thing going. So, um, so um, da -da 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 um, something like that. So, so you're using you're using a role to, to kind of Try and have some dramatic effect, um, and uh, and and also kind of encourage the dancer in in what they're doing. Uh, hopefully, you know, hopefully that that pulsating feel comes across. I'm sure different musicians would tackle that in different ways. I don't know how that relates to semi quavers, Steve. You might. No, uh, well, that's why I was saying we're doing this um, exercise on um, creating a syllabus for the pipe and tabba. And this is a syllabus for people playing, um, uh, who play early music, contemporary music, Morris or whatever. And, um, and also it's got to uh, uh, account for people who read music and also for people who play by ear. 
and for people who play by ear, term quaver and semiquaver means nothing. Um, and the old tabras uh, certainly, you know, from the descriptions we have, certainly weren't music readers um, and were, were often uh, learning from other tabras. And so, um, you know, that is a that is a question we're really looking at is uh, it, obviously if you read music, you could beat a rhythm that's written. <clears throat> but if you're a Morris tabra and you play by ear, um, then perhaps the way for teaching is more about reading the feet of the dancer. Yeah. So, so if I'm teaching, I'll get, I'll get somebody who's learning to actually dance part of the dance and then, and then sing the tune while they're tabering and then do, do some of the steps while they're tabering and sort of try and try and try and get that feel of, of the dance into, into what they're doing. And, and then just discuss, you know, what's the best way of supporting this step. Yeah. 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 Um, has anybody, um, uh, you know, um, anybody think that in their Morris side, if they were to s suggest that uh, the side actually adopted a methodology for its music, that would cause a problem? <laughs> They've gone very quiet. They have, haven't they? <laughs> I, don't I don't think they dare answer that one. No. Yeah, <laughs> that one. Well, you can you can type it anonymously to we well, can type it to me in the chat, and I won't read out your name. <laughs> Hi, it's, it, it's Jez from the Minster Strays here, so uh, I can say there'd be a riot if we tried to uh, standardise. We, we our our problem is that we often have lots of musicians in practice, and then we struggle for musicians when we actually play out. And that's what causes the issues because we can't get a consistent style between how we practice and how we play out. That's that's one of the issues. Yeah. Um, I, we just had a question here from Anon. <laughs> Anon, what do you think of the djembe as a Morris instrument? And um, as long as there is a clear methodology <laughs> that they know why that what they're doing, then <laughs> then it, it it could be a great boon um you know um but um random djembe i would think would be uh, quite difficult to dance i mean you could even go for an african beat as long as you have a methodology f for which you all agree you could dance to um you know that that would work um like i say uh, you know a lot of really good sides who dance strict tempo um and some dance strict tempo and but for jigs they dance in the footfall style and you often have one musician who's just playing for the jig and that combination um so there's there are sides which do both um um uh, there's a side that um uh, i used to uh, uh dance with um they danced one style with one musician and another style with another musician um, because <laughs> they had different ways of of of, of playing, um, <clears throat> it was always a joy to play um, at Winchester with um, with Lionel, um, uh, <laughs> because he, he he was very he was very good at uh, at, uh, at, uh, at the end telling me where I went wrong, but <laughs> I did learn from that. <laughs> but he would often well, tell me at the beginning what he wanted out of it. <laughs> well, well, on on that note, I guess we we've, we've got. Two minutes left so um I, I suppose we can reiterate that um uh, a big thank you to steve really for uh, uh for all, all of all of that uh, knowledge driving <laughs> clapping if you like would you like to unmute yourself and give um stephen and andy a round of applause hey. 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 Um, I, suppose, I suppose the key thing is, um, as many of you as possible, um, come along to the workshop in two weeks' time. Uh, if you want to learn um, Debate Bucknell, there'll be um, a slow video available. You can learn the tune very slowly, and, uh, and we'll be in a very supportive and jolly environment, cheering each other on and, uh, and just... Um, 
yeah, encouraging each other to uh, to learn a very simple tune and try and do it in a kind of a dancey way. Excellent. All right, thank you very much for coming, everybody. And um, well, see you next time. <laughs>